Fresno Lecture Series. It's our second to the last uh, public lecture for the semester. But next semester is a full roster, so please everyone join us in force and in numbers uh, next semester and spread the news about this Artist Lecture Series. In two weeks, we have uh, our final lecture of the semester, uh, Martha, Martha Lowacki, uh, who is the guest of Innova this semester, and she's coming in from Madison. So, um, I'm going to introduce, in a second, our object, uh, student from the object group, to introduce our guest. But first and foremost, I should ask all the students on your laptops to please close your laptops. Um, please. <coughs> We're waiting. Uh, obviously, anyone who takes my class knows I do not allow laptops on. Unless you're taking notes, which that never happens with certain these things. So please close your laptop and give our guests the utmost respect and attention, and let's have a, an amazing question and answer session as well. Our guest is coming from Cranbrook, right? The Cranbrook Institute, and uh, originally from Germany. Uh, Cranbrook, many of you may or may not know, is right outside of Detroit, and I've talked to my class many times about my history in Detroit, and I've actually faked and pretended that I was a professor at Cranbrook so that I could sneak into the outdoor swimming pools during the summer, which are the best swimming places in all of Southeastern Michigan. So, anyway, next time you go to Cranbrook, you know, use that and you'll get in. It's cool. All right, so next, uh, Rachel from Object. Jewelry and Metals is an amazing student group, Object, a ton of energy. It's really amazing to see. They're huge in bringing these guests to town. And Rachel, floor is yours. First, we have this great event coming up in a couple of weeks. It's November 21st, and it's the annual object jewelry sale. It'll be in the Union, and it's all day from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. So come and just, even if you don't get anything, just check it out. Our um, the theme this year is sustainability, so we'll be using like used things, and I think it's, you guys will like it. And anyways, how about yours? Iris Eichenberg, she's born in Gottingham, Germany, and spent a large part of her life in Amsterdam, Netherlands. She studied at the Rietveld Academy, taught there, and became head of the department in 2000. In 2007, Iris moved to Bloomfield, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, and accepted the position as head of department, artist in residence at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. And her work has been shown in galleries, museums, in Europe, America, and India, and she has and teaching and lecturing in Europe, America, China, India, and Africa. And today also, we had a couple of workshops with her and her grads. They're all joining us. Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, so it was a good time. And here's Iris. <laughs> Jordan. 
journalist from the Washington Post walked in, and he had it on, and he said, oh, there's this fucker from the Washington Post. <laughs> another hero of mine, born in Munich, but never studied there. This Kermakert is the embodiment of preciseness and order. 
Her work has dryness, grayness. And she masters what I call the absolute perfection of boring beauty. And that's a compliment as well. There's neither one letter nor one line too much. And her concepts give me a good headache. I can revisit the work often, and each time there's another layer to peel off. I find myself in a new conversation with her over every few years, and often can only come to terms with it for a short moment while waiting for a new confusion, which will challenge me. Let me directly explain a little bit what you see. What you see here is a block of gold which is cut in pixels. So you see a block of gold as if you have an image on a computer enlarged and you would see it pixelated. But it is actually the block of gold cut in little pieces. The pieces you have seen before, you recognize they were sort of famous people on those images. Those photos are taken from newspapers. And you also saw that all the people were handling something. They were actually performing a ritual of giving a piece of jewelry to another person. That what she has left is the ritual of giving. The actual piece is actually taken out of those images. This has been able to talk about, comment upon, and refer to jewelry, never leaving a subject matter for 15 years, and still she manages to hardly ever show a piece or make a piece of jewelry as such. This Mackert is interested in the way jewelry is presented or represented in the world. All her installations, photos, articles, responses to advertising of jewelry, empty boxes, blinded vitrines, are the world of jewelry itself, and that works across, it works across all genres of jewelry. Her social critique is subtle and subtle, and again, her search for the right intervention is again an obsession, obsession which leaves me in awe. It total, I totally like this kind of self-control. I wish I would have the self-discipline but I do not have the ability to commit myself to such controlledness, and I wish I could. What you see here, and I think it needs some explanation, are you aware that each time the President of the US is somewhere photographed, people stage the same situation the day before? And the images you saw before that, did you figure out what you saw? Before, the other image. Those are images from Madame Tussauds. So they're not real images, I mean, real people. But the funny thing, or the interesting thing is, she made a whole book of it. If you go through the images, you precisely know whether it's Boy George, or Queen, Anne, Queen Elizabeth, or Diana, or a rock star. And then you also know why you can read jewelry sometimes better than the people who are wearing it. One more. I did not realize before I started that so many of my heroes are actually coming from Munich, have been born there or studied. Karen Pontopeda is born in Denmark but it's what you, what one would call the real child of the Munich Academy. I'm thinking about earlier work when I talk about her. Engraved rings, which make me longing and wanting them all. Engraved with minimal images of objects and animals and drawings of people, plants. The most mundane, modest line drawings. For me, making something like this work would be too much pressure on a short moment. Not long enough to build a relationship or engage with the work. 
The rings themselves are often rough, direct, and superficially looked at. But then there is always care which does not show off. The gold and the rings is folded in a specific way. The backsides are enameled and invisible. The perfect combination of finished and unfinishedness. Let me show you some more of those words. I own two of those rings and I have no images, but one is a toilet and the other is a garbage can. And then there is Monika Brücher. German but spending all her adult life in France. She has the jewelry on her fingertips. Literally on her fingertips. Daring to decide that a frozen touch is enough, and it is when she makes it. Accentuating seams and patterns of simple prudish dresses and drawing parallels of clothes and skin. It asks for a certain belief in enoughness, which I admire, but I do not trust myself that I could make work believable in the same way. A nearly Catholic schoolgirl performance, or I should say it is actually Catholic schoolgirl work. And who would or could have envisioned that that kind of work is and can be very seductive. <coughs> a daring group on a line of what one could, what can or should be conveyed, risking to be misread. She knows how to remain being poignant. The silence in her work is like a beautiful long sound. All this work fills me with envy and desire, but the process, the making, it is foreign to me. Why? Why is it foreign to me? It's a question I'm asking myself, but I also hope, hope you can help me in a second to answer that question. On making and on myself. Let me run with you through, forwards, backwards, along the traceable lines of my work. Because only in retrospect, long after the event, I might know what happened. I might be able, for a moment, to understand my working process and name my little helpers. One is the hidden narrative, my gauge and my measurement. I smell a narrative and I make it up while working. I could say that I try to sharpen a very blurry picture. I work my way towards something that only comes into being because I sense it exists. Sorry. I'm not loyal to my hidden stories. They serve me as crutches. But as soon as I can walk, I leave them behind. I observe the battle of my narrative and the material I weave into it. <coughs> so how do I work? I collect things, pile them up, listen to them, talk to another, rubbing on each other, striking up conversations. I introduce strangers to each other and urge them to meet by giving them a space in which they get to know each other. I rearrange them, I rearrange them, change the direction of their conversations. I collect an order, trying to find the key to what is hidden in objects and materials. I surround myself with things that trigger and provoke me. Here are samples of different series of works, works that have never met each other before. And these two images are images of 
were parts of a series of 15 years, which I had together for the first time in my life um, two years ago after it happened in an overview, an overview exhibition. And the big disillusion was that I thought it was very original and that every piece of every body of work was so different from the other body that you could actually never bring them together. And then there they were lying all on the table and I had to confront myself. I had to learn the fact that although I thought each body was really different and I had recreated myself and I had made a totally different body of work, they were all sitting there together being very friendly to each other and I could see so many similarities um, that it blocked me for half a year to make more work because I thought maybe I'm done. But it wasn't. So let me quote myself and what I wrote in a catalog. The catalog which has been created, or the show has been created by two famous students from Cranbrook, Seth Papak and Bruce Kuhlwein at Snag. And some of you, has anybody been at Snag last year? So you might have seen the show. Sense <coughs> mapping. How is it that a color is able to evoke the sensation of taste? And how does weight, not touched, not carried, trigger the strengthening of our muscles? And why would a visible, endless repetition of handling stretch the notion of time and have a sound to it and a rhythm still active of the work after the work has ended? How can remnants of process be frozen in the memory of surface and bring back a sense of movement? How can we feel the pulling and stitching in our hands? How does, how does the process of crafting work enable you, our hands to think? Or is it the hand at work which informs your thinking? The unconscious recognition of tactility, <coughs> sound, size, smell and temperature of environments is what allows us to differentiate one context from another. These contexts are filled with the eventness of material. Materials in conversation with each other, striking up conversations. How do we make sense of my, my how do I make sense of my surroundings? And how do I sense it? And how do you sense it? The intermingling and exchange of senses, consciousness and conscious and unconscious are the construction elements of what I make of a visual encounter. This puzzling together and being puzzled, this process of making sense, that is what I'm interested in. I avoid the need to make sense of an object instantly. The event should not be linear, but rather <coughs> gather around, departing and re-entering the encounter with the object. The embodiment of objects is the sensation I try to find in the uttermost silence, in the presence of work. The event should not be the, the event should be the work and not consumption. Kleinlanden, the name of the little town in the center of Germany where I was born some time ago. And the title of the work. This image is hard, this image shows, this image shows, it's hard to tell, the hands of my brother's grandmother knitting in 1909. It is impossible to rewrite the lines of her life story, yet you can see the remnants and complexity of her attempt. Or maybe this is my attempt to understand her life. 
even if all of us remain empty, there's always a suggestion of a being, a portrait. The absence of the objects and subject, or the remnants of a process. Both are ways of talking about longing for the presence of a person, or for the landscapes of ourselves. <coughs> the portrait, in its absence, is a re-emerging image of loss and love in my work. And only know I know that this oval filled in with an old photo of my grandmother's hands resting in her lap would be the only oval in my work with a real portrait, the actual representation. Many versions of oval would follow, and as much as I try to find them, try to get away from the oval shape, they reoccur again and again. Many thought Many which follow would rather address the absence of people in order to recall their presence. I would try not to give a literal representation. From how far do you recognize a familiar person? How do we learn to read bodies in the language? A large skin structure does not allow us to identify a familiar person. When we find ourselves identifying the one in the crowd, walking far away just by the way the hat is slightly tilted and tucked away between the shoulders, every other step he or she makes. The outlines of a group, the positioning of individuals on an old photograph, has a far more subversive power than the direct representation. The oval as a cliché and metaphor is hard to escape. Its immediate referential power seduces me and is at the same time an obstacle I try to overcome through transformation and obstruction. One of my many hate-love relationships I seem to entertain. Tenement Timelines is a body of work from 2007. Chatelaine is based on the interpretation of household utensils and hands. I have a complete catalog here as well, so if you want to see the whole body of work, I will not spend too much time to get into details. These hands and thinking about who might have used them, their appearance in different materials, techniques, and culturally informed combinations allow them to force, allow them or force them especially in a rather in a rather weird eclectic group of work. What I was addressing with that body of work is taste. How do we, how do we, um, well, let me say how. How do we think we have a taste? We also talked about taste, to, to, about taste today. And how do we develop taste? What is left of taste when you actually leave your context? What is left of your taste if you're confronted with people in another country, in another culture? What I aim to question is how much does taste depend on place and time and context? For what reason do we appreciate things out of taste? And should we wish to have a taste? We had recently a speaker at Cranbrook who um, said something very interesting about taste. She said taste is like a big, heavy blanket on top of you. And if you're not able to take the blanket off, you will never be able to see anything else. Let me go to my next example of work. Overcoming nothingness, or better, falling in love with the ugly. It is not only what we enable in the other, but equally in this case, more important what the others enable me to overcome or to do. By using seemingly unimportant, dull, 
unprecious material and then beating them up by inappropriate introduction of techniques, time-consuming labor, and penetrating attention for its nothingness. I'm trying to foreground the beauty of an ob ignored object. Last but not least, another love and hate affair mirrors, non-existing in my daily surrounding, but often revisited in my work. I try to diffuse the ability when I mention what I meant, mentioned earlier, that my working process often entails the overcoming of material or obstruction of an archetype or embracing a cliché in order to overcome it, then it is the wish to blur or to force a reflection upon these uncontrollable objects. Ugly car mirrors, old rags and a jerry can formed the base for the work of the theory student made in 2001. This work still challenges me. This work is still teaching me a lesson, and more than with other bodies, maybe even more successful in which are maybe more successful in different ways, this work engages me for a different reasons ever so often. Making use of the contradiction to create fiction, friction, and to convey an internal dialogue in each piece of work is what I will end up doing and making again, playing with the expectation of the viewer but never fulfilling her or his expectations. I never only work on one piece. There's always a group of which each member is helping the other one to become. <coughs> and here I travel with you through some bodies of work I made in the last few years, which probably discuss the sense and the notion of abject and attraction. The body of work which is still pretty close to me and also rather private, so I just walk with you through it. What you look at it is an emerald work, gold, beads and pentacles. Those pieces which I consider as very beautiful have had various um, controversial reactions to them. And again you see the mirror and I can't escape it and I really, really dislike mirrors. It's like all these pieces are actually necklaces, and um, we discussed today about what does it, what does what happens to a piece if you envision it on the body. And I'm also I have the tendency to also sometimes work and only test the work out on the body after it's been made. And I must say that this theory of work was very successful on the body. This is part of a body of work uh, which is called Michigan Flowers and Birds and it's intentional that it is the most boring title you can come up with. So these are the flowers of Michigan and these are the birds of Michigan. As much as I feel attracted to beautiful craftsmanship, there is a line that I will not cross. This may explain why there are no drawings, no testing of technique, no traceable map to expose and demonstrate the process of making. My work is a drawing of itself by itself, and it always retains the quality of a fast drawing, no matter how long I work on it. The works of others are products with which I start a dialogue once finished. The dialogue with my own work started a long time ago and I judged it by the ability to keep me engaged in a dialogue. Losing them feels like losing a partner while having a dialogue. And, also, and although I compared, compared at the beginning of my talk that buying your own work might feel like telling yourself a joke, I do need to sort of surprise myself with my work. I need the encounter with a stranger. And if I can predict the final result, I'm bored. And that would be in the bad sense of the word. <clears throat> the 
These birds might look very sad, but once they have been made, the maker was not sad anymore. Let me ask you some questions, maybe that helps. So what do you want them to teach you here? But it's not there. Yeah. So how do you know? That's a little bit like this. I once had an intern who wanted to learn all about bookkeeping, but I had no work and I thought, make the work first and then I can tell you how well, to do your work. That's interesting because I think that's one of the best starting points if you can have questions about something you don't know. Most people can't ask questions about something they don't know, so if you can ask those questions, I think you're going to be a perfect student. And cross the bridges once you come close to them, because uh, make the work first. And hopefully it's not, it's going to be totally different within a few years. I know what you've expected. So, and also, Judge Miller has a separate question that I would The craft first, first craft question. Very boring. <laughs> <laughs> Is it because it always, we always ask this, those questions that we have doubt about quality, the quality we are not engaged in that question at all. How do you answer that question for yourself right now? I'm not there yet. You're not there yet? So what is it you were in right now? So it's a string with a piece, and I would so, it's a, it's a, yeah. No, I understand, but I would clearly say that is a piece of jewelry. 
if, as soon as I could actually see that you have interfered with it and it has gone through a transformation, then we can start the art discussion. More questions? Mm -hmm. It was very intentional because I thought about thirty car mirrors to work with them. And why? They were really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they were really, really ugly. And horrible to work with. Oh, there's such a wide range of material use. How do you decide what to use and how to use it? That's a good question. Um, I don't think that you can start thinking through a material and then get to a matter of content. I very often have, and I, as I, I said that in the lecture, it is not that I have sort of like clear story, clear body, body of, of work in mind, but I sense something. And, um, and there is a sort of narrative which actually forms and grows and creates and shifts while I work on it. And then I test out materials. Sorry, I test out materials. Which materials actually would work? You can compare with speaking different languages. Once you speak different languages, you know that there are certain words and certain circumstances in another language, which can only have occurred in that language because it's a different culture, a different nature, and different people, and a different past history. So if you speak different languages you're also aware that you can tell different things in different languages. You also know the more words you have, the more articulated you can be in what you try to tell. And I think that's where my interest in, in materials comes in, why I find it important to use a lot of different materials. What's the disconnect? A lack of cohesion. What is cohesion? Successful if you already glued some tape or something and then you figure out you need to solder something to it. So it's also sort of frustrating. Um, but it is literally that I, I make work as if somebody would make a drawing by adding, taking away, correcting, erasing, and confronting material with. Because if you see it coherent, coherent for me is if materials have a good argument together. But, um, I find it a problem if you, well it's the discussion we have very often when we critique work, is it's kind of cold connections where you actually sort of have two materials and they're attached to each other and what you see is, is a couple which will never fall in love with each other. Um, you wonder why they're next to each other and how the pieces about the technical solution, how to connect them. Yeah, that's something I'm trying to avoid. I'm trying to avoid, the, I mean, I'm, I'm working on work where you not immediately ask, why is it, why is that material together, how is it made? But then you experience the form in relation to the material. Is it an answer? Figure out where do I want to situate something. 
And if I make a drawing that has the actual realization of the next step is so different from the drawing, there's more what I smell or sense in the drawing, and there's more the quality of the drawing than that I would actually ever make what I've been drawing before. I see that more as a design process, and that's just not how it, it would bore me to death to work like that. Ladies first. Okay. Um, you were talking a lot about um, narrative and um, whatnot, and um, about conversations between objects, and with all the um, chatter going on in the world between objects, whether it's through advertisements or whatnot, how do you decide which narratives, or is it possible that, narr that certain narratives have no value and others are important? Important, important for who? For me or for some, uh, somebody else? All oh, for anything. Um, yes, that's true. Well, I sort of heard that I'm, I'm not very loyal to my narratives. Mm -hmm. I make them up. And if I need to change them, I change them. It only helps me to control and check, check and bias the, the while I'm making. But the, sometimes the, the work grows to in a phase where it actually is further than the narrative I ever had in my mind. So I'm a total liar. But I do need my lies. in a hardware store in a museum. Um, yeah, I, I'm collecting, collecting and leave materials and um, the studio form is the strangest things which find you. I mean, sometimes after years will only be find, find use. And I find it also very important to, I mean, that you really have a big library or vocabulary of materials around you when you work. But I also do, when I have a body of work finished, I pack everything up and I start anew. It's not that I'm sitting in the same soup of material all the time. You had uh, briefly mentioned that once you had taken all the pieces that you made, you put them all together in the same plane that you had um, somehow gotten a block for a year. Um, and thought that maybe you just finish. Um, as advice, like how would you recommend someone to get yourself out of that lot once you created it? Like how did you? Don't sit and wait. And uh, it's a little bit like you get the appetite while making. Don't think that you come up, especially at the moment, like that was a great idea. Just start making. And don't judge it and give yourself a few weeks of just keep making. And that would change that moment. But sitting and waiting, it's a killer. Don't do it. So just like pick up something and just yeah. Like, well, remake. I think what I find because I mean I got blocked because I sort of okay, I've made everything, so everything what I made looks just again like something of this work. Um, so I thought, okay, I can try to avoid that, or can I can be it in a different way? And I thought, okay, let's just revisit work which was really important to me, and, and remake it. And then you will find yourself, you're not able to remake. I mean, you can't plagiarize yourself. You can't remake something, what you've done before, because you're not the same person anymore. So automatically, you will make something different. And uh, I guess that helps. <coughs> You try to make this more embarrassing than it is. No, okay. <laughs> um, no, as I said, it's, it's very funny. The, the, the days before an opening, I have like a yo-yo. I go like, yes, and then it all 
Oh my god, oh my god, no, 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 I'm not going to show that. No, no, oh, it was all a mistake, it's all a bluff. This time everybody will see it. So that goes on for the for the opening, and then I have no way back, and then I go to the opening, and I must say that I always find it it's interesting to see the world once it entered its world, and it's somewhere else, and it's what I said, that it becomes strangers, and only friends after years. Um, of course, I know which pieces are like 100% right, and they're always some, um, it's like, there's a core family, and I'm very proud of that. And then there are some love affairs, and nieces and nephews, and they are allowed at the party, and there's always this aunt, which should not have been invited, but it's at the exhibition. And it's, again, and it's funny, I, it's nearly as if you always need like a dog to piss in the corner, so yeah, I do have all the pieces to fulfill that, fulfill that need of mine too. Because proud is one thing, but I also like to be annoyed by parts of the world. And sometimes they become really good relatives, they... I, I see the uh, clear connection between the, the influences you show, the three artists that you showed, and the connection that was made between their work and perhaps yours. Can you talk more about the influences of place, especially your move, perhaps, to the U.S. and how Michigan and, and your time here has Oh yeah, um, I didn't show any work I made when I, because I made a small selection of work I, I made. There's this body of work which I made, it's called New Rooms, and I did bring a catalog, and that was, for me it was, it was just, I needed to do it because I was really battling with taste and preoccupations and a lot of opinions I had about America, about craft, about use of materials, about American artwork. Um, only to find myself that I had to correct a lot of things. And, um, and then after two years, everything that I saw was true was not true anymore. So that was quite confusing. Um, and when I mentioned this, in the, well, taste before, my taste totally changed. I'm in love with things I before would have not even spent a second looking at. Because I am part of a certain culture, I know where it comes from, I know what it signifies, I know within what realm of, of discussion it's produced. I look at things which I've only seen in films, and all of a sudden it's my daily life. So it has tremendously changed my view and my tastes and my tastes and but I, I mean I think like this this work was probably the extremist and I remember showing it first in Europe so that was the first time I would actually come home to Amsterdam with work which was influenced and produced somewhere else. And um, so it was not only confusing for me, it was also confusing for collectors and, and people who were used to my work. But um, it was helpful, it was necessary. I'm happy that I actually have the chance or possibility in my life to get so confused and correct everything I saw before. A very cheerful note we can end. I can